Okay, today we're going to talk about actually a Chem 345 topic called hydrate formation. And then we're going to talk about pyritic acid and follow that by ozonosis. Okay, first of all, Chem 345 topic, hydri hydrate formation. It's important to understand this for next reaction. Then in the presence of a catalytic amount of base or in the presence of a catalytic amount of acid, carbonyls such as ketones and aldehydes are in equilibrium with hydrates where we have two OHs attached to the same sp3 carbon. Now hydrates are unstable species. You never have very many, much of a hydrate at all. If you try to isolate a hydrate, it rapidly becomes a carbonyl, acetyl bondo. Now, the mechanisms of these reactions are completely reversible. In the case of base, you have hydroxide adds to the carbon and electrons go up. The reason they're adding to this carbon right here is because of this resonance structure. Now, since this is the major resonance structure, that's the one that I'm going to draw the electrons to and carry on the mechanism with is just the major resonance structure. And then you can protonate. And these reactions are completely reversible. The reverse of the reaction is simply that's the reverse of this last step, followed by O minus swing down, kicking the OH off. Now we've been talking about how OH minus isn't a good leaving group, and that's true. It's not a good leaving group. It's not a good leaving group for SN1, SN2, E1, and E2 chemistries. But this is not an SN1, SN2, E1, or E2 reaction. Think of it as the O minus swinging its electrons down and kicking off the OH, the extra boost of this. And you can do this because of the carbon oxygen pi bond is actually pretty strong. And you're going from, you're not actually going up or down in basis, so you're keeping that the same. Okay. So, there's this. And we've seen this pattern before. Remember in the osmium tetroxide? OH minus adds to the osmium, electrons go up to the O. And the O minus swings down and kicks off an oxygen. It's the same premise.
as this mechanism. Now in the case of the acid, what we do is we protonate the carbonyl first. And if you use, you can protonate with H3O plus. And then the water attacks. Followed by deprotonation. The backwards reaction is literally just each step backwards. Think of it as we're protonating the OH here to be a good leaving group. Then we use the electrons from an O, swing down and kick that off. And then deep rotation. Now here we protonate the OH to form a good leaving group. But in the case of the base, we didn't need to protonate the OH to form a good leaving group. The difference is has to do with the two oxygens. Here this oxygen has two lone pairs. Here this oxygen has three lone pairs. You can think of this oxygen here, the O minus, having much greater amount of electron density and therefore it has more strength, more power to force that OH off. As up to here, that oxygen doesn't have as much electron density and so in order to kick off that that oxygen, it needs to be protonated first. Now, in each of these cases, you need a catalytic amount of base or a catalytic amount of acid to do this reaction. For this phenomenon, you shouldn't really say reaction, it's more of a phenomenon. When you have a carbonyl in water, you will have this reaction. And catalytic, you need only the tiniest amount. In fact, it's not, it's very difficult not to have that acid or base around to do this reaction right here. Um, glass, um, the walls of a beaker are acidic enough to catalyze this reaction. So just keep that in mind, that whenever you see a ketone or an aldehyde, a small bit of it, small percentage of that ketone and aldehyde will be in a hydrate form. Okay. Now, with that said, last time, We talked about osmium tetroxide and how it generates two OHs sent to each other. Now, let's talk about what we can do with those two OHs. Well, one thing you can do with them is treat it with HiO4. HiO4 is pyritic acid. And it looks something like this. If 
If you notice, this molecule right here, as I've drawn it, it violates the octet. It, it, it just really, really violates the octet rule. Don't worry about that. Iodine is in um, the lower, um, lower rows, and the atoms in the lower rows have a tendency to violate the octet quite a bit. It's in group seven, it's a halogen, um, and so if you want to remember how many bonds to oxygen HiO4 has, you just have to remember that it's in group seven, and you'll have seven bonds of oxygen, seven bonds to oxygen in HiO4. Anyways, what it does is it takes a molecule that has two OHs on adjacent carbons. and it splits it in half. This reaction breaks a carbon-carbon sigma bond. This is the first reaction that we've had that actually is able to do that. And specifically, it breaks it that are between two OHs, and they have to be adjacent to each other. If they weren't adjacent to each other, you don't get a reaction at all. Now, I drew it as part of a ring. It doesn't have to be a ring. It can take this reaction and split it and wipe. By splitting it, you, you find the two carbons attached to the OH, clip it in half, and each of those OHs become a carbonyl. Now, it's just not two adjacent OHs that can do this. If you have a two hydroxycarbonyl, this can also split it. But the thing to remember about this when trying to predict the product and how it works has to do with what we started talking about at the beginning of this lecture. HiO4, whether we write it in or not, always has water present. So as a result, you always have water present. That means HiO4 is also an acid, water. This molecule right here is in equilibrium with this hydrate. And then if you look, There is the pattern that breaks it apart, and then the OH becomes a carbonyl, and on the right hand side, only one of those OHs becomes a carbonyl, and you get a carboxylic acid.
if you have a dicarbonyl, HiO4 will cleave that as well. One, two, three, four, five, six. It will cleave the bond between those two carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you'll get two carboxylic acids. Okay, so mechanism. And let's go ahead and do the mechanism. this. And I deliberately put them both as wedges. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So first thing that happens is we're going to activate the HiO4. We're going to protonate one of these double bondos using the other using another molecule of HiO4. And then we're going to use the electrons from the OH to add to the iodide, and the electrons go up. And then I'm going to use water to take that proton off. The water that's always present with HiO4. That's the first thing. What this mechanism is, or what it's similar to, is this mechanism right here where we protonate the double bond O, have the neutral oxygen attack, electrons go up, and then deprotonate the oxygen. Same mechanism. The only difference is, instead of a C here, we have an I there. That's it. And what we've managed to do is attach this OR group onto an iodine and change one of those double bond O's into an OH. Then we just repeat the process. Now you can use repeat if you want to draw out the mechanism. I'll go ahead and draw that out real quick. This H3O plus protonates. We generated that up here. The 
that activates. The double mondo. And the electrons from the other oxygen add. Electrons go up. and water depronates. Now one of the hard things to do is keep track of how many OHs are on that iodine. And what I have to do is I have to count I have to remember that there should be seven bonds to oxygen. Two of those are double bonded to the O, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six. I only have six bonds to oxygen, so I have another OH there, seven. Now, now you can draw this mechanism out, or you can just use that really beautiful word repeat and go right to this molecule. That molecule You're trying to draw it out. Consists of one double bond O to the I. And now we currently have four bonds to oxygen. We fill in enough OHs to make it seven. This molecule right here is the key intermediate. If you cannot form this molecule, the reaction does not happen. And then what happens is you break the carbon-carbon sigma bond. You can go clockwise or counterclockwise, it doesn't matter. What you do is you take the carbon-carbon bond between the two O's and move it to form a double bond O. That takes the electrons from the O and places them onto the I. Then you go over to the other I to the O bond and those electrons swing over and that completes the circuit. and you end up with this as your product. And the iodine species has been reduced. Okay. Now, this is the key intermediate. I purposely started out with two wedges on that um, cyclohexane. Because most um, textbooks show this reaction of having a cis dial. And can you make this intermediate in a trans dial? And the answer is maybe. So the idea is
you have to make this cyclic intermediate. So let's do the cis one first. Can you make link those two oxygens with a single atom? Well, here we have the chair confirmation. What I can do is I can draw an iodine right here. And I can make them link together, just like so. But if this OH and this OH were like this, the cyclic intermediate cannot be formed. Because there's no way to link those two oxygens with a single atom. Because they are 180 degrees apart from each other. The atom would have to be right in the middle of that carbon-carbon bond. And that just doesn't work. Yet, This molecule right here is known to do this reaction. So what gives? Well, this molecule here can chair flip. Remember, when you chair flip, all axials become equatorials, all equatorials become axials. So when you chair flip, it becomes like this. And if I have an iodine right there, you can form the cyclic compound. So, when you're doing these reactions and you're involving a six-membered ring, at least one OH must be equatorial. Now, with that in mind, one of these molecules will react fast with HiO4. The other molecule will not. So go ahead and pause this um, video.
Try to figure out which one will react quickly with HIO4 and which one will not. And these two molecules are diastereomers of each other. I'll wait. So, let's get a little bit of space. This molecule right here Draw a chair conformation. The carbon that has a terpetal group on it, we want the terpetal group to be equatorial. It's going up, so in the up equatorial position would be off of this carbon. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. The OH here is axial. OH here is axial. Here we have a case of diaxial and with this being a terpetal group this locks the ring in this conformation meaning it doesn't chair flip so therefore no reaction. We check a look at the bottom one The terpeno group wants to go down, so the down equatorial one is off of this carbon. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Carbon four going up. Carbon five. Here, they're both equatorial. And at least one of them needs to be equatorial in order to form the cyclic intermediate. That means this molecule can split. Like so. Now, taken together, the following reactions make a powerful combination. Osmin tetroxide NMO, followed by HIO4. What happens in this reaction is the osmin tetroxide NMO adds two OHs thin to each other and then HIO4 cleaves between it and so essentially what's happening is we're cutting a carbon-carbon double bond. And where we're cutting it is across the double bond And where to cut it, we cut it at carbon 2, that gets a double bond O. Carbon 5 gets a double bond O. That's a very potent technique to split an alkene like that. Now, there is another way we can split an alkene. It's also a two-step reaction. It's called ozonolysis. involves taking ozone 
followed by some sort of workup. And there's two types of workups. There's a reductive workup. Examples of reductive workup are triphenylphosphine. or dimethyl sulfide, which smells really, really bad, or zinc and acetic acid. There's another one, workup, called an oxidative workup, and that's typically acid and hydrogen peroxide. The difference between these two workups, one gives you one set of products, the other one gives the other. Reductive workups, aldehydes survive. Oxidative workups, any aldehyde is converted to a carboxylic acid. That's the difference between them. So for the purposes of the mechanism in the first start, let's start with, say, triphenylphosphine. And what happens in this reaction is pretty much what happens when you use HiO4 or osmium tetra I'm sorry, osmium tetroxide followed by HiO4. You split the double bond in half, and each carbon gets a carbonyl. Okay. Mechanism. And we're going to do the work ox, the reductive workup mechanism. The oxidative workup we'll talk about, um, but that mechanism is not really clear what's going on there. So we'll start out with the reductive workup one. This molecule right here. O3 is ozone. And what happens in this mechanism is you do what's called a cycloaddition, where we're going to be forming bonds and making bonds all in one step. The O minus goes to one of the two carbons. It doesn't matter which one. The alkene double bond goes to this oxygen. And that kicks the oxygen and oxygen pi electrons up onto the O positive. And this is an irreversible reaction. And it's all happening in one step. That means that the stereochemistry doesn't change. Cis stays cis, trans stays trans. So the two ethyl groups are cis to each other. So I'm going to put them both as wedges. Mechanisms, you don't have to show stereochemistry. I'm just showing it. And then what we've done is created this. This intermediate is called the primary ozonide. 
and it turns out it's quite unstable. Now you can kind of look at it, it has two oxygen oxygen single bonds. And we've already talked about how unstable molecules are that contain oxygen oxygen single bonds are. And this one is particularly bad. And so what happens is this actually breaks apart the carbon-carbon bond, and it doesn't matter which way you draw it. You can draw it either way. Breaks apart there. The O O single bond goes onto this oxygen here, and then you use a lone pair from this oxygen to swing down. What that gets you is this molecule right here, and it gets you this molecule here. All I did was I flipped the right half over to give you that. It's kind of important to do. If you drew the electrons in the opposite manner, these electrons go here, these electrons go up here, and the lone pair goes there. Then you end up with this structure. Either way, you get this situation. And what these two molecules then do is they recombine. The electrons from the O minus adds to the carbon. The pi bond shifts over to this carbon right here. That kicks those electrons up onto that oxygen. Or you can do the same thing with this. Regardless, what you do you end up getting this molecule, regardless which pathway you take. You get what's called the secondary ozonide. And this is the molecule that waits for the workup. So if we were to split the reaction sequence up, you would actually get a mixture of these two molecules. And these two molecules, wait till you add whatever workup you want to them. If you're wondering where these two diastereomers came from, it came from here. This carbon and this carbon 
are sp2 carbons, they're becoming sp3. And so any stereochemistry, R or S, it's possible, so you get all four possible combinations when they add back together. So we'll get a statistical mixture of that. Now what the reductive workup does is it's the one that's responsible for breaking the secondary ozonide up Getting you that. And the mechanism of that is you have a lone pair on the phosphorus or the lone pair on the sulfur if you're using dimethyl sulfide. And it attacks one of the oxygens that's singly bonded. Let's have it attack the less hindered oxygen oxygen, but either one, it does not matter. And we get this molecule. This molecule here, O minus carbon oxygen. This motif right here is very, very important in organic chemistry. And you'll see this motif all the time in Chem 345. I mean, all the time. And in fact, this isn't the first time we've drawn this motif today. the very beginning of lecture. We had this motif. O minus attached to the same carbon as a neutral oxygen. And what it does is the same thing here. O minus swings its electrons down and kicks off the neutral oxygen. giving you one product. And then we have that same motif again. O minus, that's the same carbon as a neutral oxygen. That O minus swings its electrons down and kicks off that neutral oxygen. And I lost a carbon. There you go. Like so. And then the byproduct is simply this. And there's two products. Now, oxidative workup, ozonolysis. And this mechanism is not one that's well understood. The ozonolysis part is well understood, but the oxidative um, workup is less so. But you do the same process. You split the carbon-carbon double bond. The difference then 
is you look for aldehydes. That's a ketone. So it doesn't react further. This right here is an aldehyde. And under these conditions, aldehydes become carboxylic acids. That's the only difference between an oxidative workup and a reductive workup. And since this becomes a carboxylic acid, you just add an OH. Ketones are left alone. But any aldehydes that you would make or are present in the molecule become carboxylic acids. And that's the oxidative workup. Okay. That's all I have for today. So have a great weekend. And also don't forget the um, take home quiz is due on Wednesday.